Since their creation, video games have captured the hearts and minds of those who play them. But for some, that initial spark of joy evolves into a burning passion to craft them. Today, we're learning about sound design and music composition. This is how to get a job in the game industry, presented by Windows 11. Brings you closer to what you love. My name's Peter McConnell. I've been writing music for games for 30 plus years. I started out at LucasArts in the early 90s and scored titles like Monkey Island 2 and Grim Fandango. Uh, more recently, I've been on my own since about 2000, and you can hear my music in the Sly Cooper series, Hearthstone, Brutal Legend, and Psychonauts. I'm Jonas Senzel. Uh, I'm a composer and a sound designer for Daniel Mullins Games, and I've worked on Pony Island, The Hex, and Inscription. There are lots of aspects of sound in a game, and the composer is generally just responsible for one of them, and that's music. The other aspects are things like voice and sound effects and uh, sound design, which is a slightly different thing. Well, a sound designer, it, it sort of depends exactly on, on the situation, whether or not you're you know recording everything yourself or if your job is more stitching together existing recordings uh, into something new. Uh, but really the job of the sound designer is to take the game, take the vision of the developer and turn that into audio. You're kind of in charge of the whole audio sphere from the most mundane basic bits and bobs to the most kind of out in front of big exciting sounds. With games you're really or oriented towards the picture and the visuals because you're scoring something that people are seeing and you're scoring a visual story so I always start with art sometimes just still pictures that uh, a development team will give to me. One of the really fun parts about Inscription, for example, was it was the first time working on a card game, which is a little bit more sort of strategy oriented than some of Daniel's other games. And he was really expressing that the music needs to be more nuanced, more background, more fewer layers. Different types of games might have a, a different way in which the music fits closely or more closely or less closely with the action. Uh, and the project team might have a very different style. So some teams, they'll want to be involved in every step. Other teams will just say, here, we love what you do. Here's some art. Go crazy. Here goes nothing. I got my start in the gaming industry in a um, non-recommendable way, perhaps. I basically, when I was a teenager, started going on Reddit uh, and offering music for free. So I got started uh, in the games business kind of by accident and a long time ago when the industry was really young. And um, really, it started with the fact that I and a couple of other guys in Boston wanted to start a rock and roll band out in California. It took a while for us to get out and get the band started. And by the time Clint and I got out, Michael had already gotten this job at LucasArts, starting an audio department. And, um, he, you know, he, he called me one day and said, you know, uh, you really got to see what we're doing here because it's pretty cool. And so I went in and he showed me a game called Monkey Island. It took me many, many, you know, bad game projects. Like, not, not necessarily that the game was bad, but, you know, no pay, never comes out, the, the, you're, you're not exactly sure about how serious the other people are about the project, and I did a, a decent amount of those. There are all these incredible possibilities about what you can do with sound and interactivity, with music and interactivity. So I got started by being interested in that it's both a technical problem and a compositional problem. How do you write music for something you can't predict? The only real good advice, I think, is that the most important thing is your relationship to the music. You really want to understand the literature, if you want to call it that, of, of the history of games and the history of music in games and what what people care about who are making um, games. I think a lot of people coming up in the game audio world have this idea that, okay, the way you get a game audio job is to 
be professional, you know, present very professionally, have a professional website, have a reel that sounds like AAA games. And I think that that's not a great approach on multiple fronts. You know, on the one hand, it's not, it probably won't get you a job, but more importantly than that, um, it's a lot more fulfilling to kind of pave your own path when it comes to having sound. Get any job at a game company, work in QA, learn how, learn how the sausage is made. I don't have much expensive gear. I, I never have. I've oftentimes worked in, in weird setups. Um, actually, a track that is about to come out or that just came out that a lot of I've been getting a lot of positive feedback on and I recorded it in a apartment in France on a broken uh, Scarlet interface, the cheapest like in, entry level interface sitting on the floor. Well, there are a lot of tools that you're going to want to know inside out as a composer, as a musician. One of the most important tools is Excel. <laughs> the first thing you want to do as a composer is be organized. And so you're going to be living in a world of Excel and uh, Google Sheets um, roughly a third of the time that you're doing this work. I'm definitely of the opinion, uh, rather than buying expensive gear, uh, spending your money on more smaller sort of the, these boutique brands that are much more around now of like little samplers, little drum machines, little synthesizers that bring their own thing to the table that are different or that are lo-fi or that are constructed um, in some weird way. They're all over the place now. Uh, and I think those give a much more unique sound and much more bang for your buck than spending the money on the huge, super famous, super known synthesizer uh, that's going to sound honestly really close to the emulated version that you have in your computer. A score for a game might have, for a big game, might have 300 cues in it. That's a massive amount of music. And somehow you got to track all that stuff and all the stages of, of where it's at. And it's pretty much um, up to you, the composer, to do that. So organization is key. I would like to offer up that not just to not buy the expensive gear, but to spend your gear money smartly on these uh, smaller sort of eccentric gear pieces, which I can recommend a few of. This is the, the Micro Granny by Bastel. It's like a weird, tiny granular synthesizer that's lo-fi. Um, the, the pocket operators, these are very known, but they're incredible, especially this one is a sampler. Uh, it's amazing, and the, you can get these weird cases for them as well. Um, and I also want to recommend the Volca Modular, which is a super strange modular synth. Um, that's probably about $10,000 worth of modules if it was in a real modular, and it's like 200 bucks, something like that. So these are all pretty cheap compared to most gear. Of course, you want to be well-versed in things like Reaper and Pro Tools and uh, perhaps Logic or Cubase. Um, people have their preferences about what digital audio workstations they want to work with. Pro Tools is, is kind of the lingua franca of the production world, so you should at least have a, a passing acquaintance with, with that software. Game composers, one of your you know, number one traits has got to be humility. When you're writing for games, you, know, you have to recognize that there is, you're not just writing music for music's sake, there is a project there and your job is about making the best thing for that project. But just in general, it's really important to check your ego at the door. Huge shout out to Jonas Senzel and Peter McConnell for taking the time to drop advice and tell their stories. And a big thank you to Windows 11 for giving us the opportunity to interview our guests today. For more on all things gaming, stay tuned to IGN.